Hello, and welcome to today's broadcast, Drug Delivery Nanoparticles Illuminated, the Light Scattering Toolkit, Part 1, Batch Measurements. This is the first in a two-part webinar series dealing with the application of light scattering to characterizing drug delivery nanoparticles with a focus on unfractionated measurements using DLS, MPPALS, and CGMALS. My name is Lindsay East. I'm the Marketing Manager for Wyatt Technology, and I'll host this event. Today's speaker is Dr. Daniel Sohm, Principal Scientist and Director of Marketing for Wyatt Technology. Dr. Sohm has been with Wyatt for over 11 years, first in R&D and then in the marketing department. Prior to joining the scientific instrumentation world, his professional endeavors included the semiconductor and defense industries. Dan completed his undergraduate degree in physics at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology, his doctoral research in the Brown University Physics Department, and the postdoctoral research at Los Alamos National Lab and the Wiseman Institute of Science. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Daniel Sohm. Thank you very much, Lindsay, for that introduction, and uh, thanks to uh, the viewers who are joining in <clears throat> to listen to this webinar. So the topic of our webinar today will be uh, the applications of light scattering in its various flavors to characterizing nanoparticles, in particular those nanoparticles used for drug delivery. And this will be a two-part series, as Lindsay mentioned. In the first part, we'll focus on what we call batch measurements, and I'll tell you shortly just what that means. But first, let's um, think a little bit about what our questions are for the analytical instrumentation in the course of developing nanopharmaceuticals. So there are certain questions that we'll be asking of our systems. And the first set of questions would be, what are the solution properties of the constituent macromolecules that are coming together to form these drug delivery nanoparticles, whether they're the structural part, uh, the polymers, the lipids that form the structure of the nanoparticle, or the active ingredients, for instance, the small molecule drug, um, uh, oligonucleotides uh, that may be uh, bound to the outside of the particle for uh, targeting purposes, peptides, which might be the active ingredient, and proteins could possibly go either way. And so in looking in those constituent macromolecules, uh, the basic biophysical characterization that we'll be doing will include assessments of molecular weight, the oligomeric state of those molecules, their size, uh, their conformation, conjugation state, that is if we're sticking together uh, two entities such as proteins and uh, polymers, uh, how are they conjugated, as well as their charge state, which is of course important for uh, their binding properties as well as for their solution uh, equilibrium and stability properties. The second set of questions that we'll be asking are what are the solution properties of the nanoparticles after they've formed? So again, basic physical properties relating to size, aggregation, stability, uh, what's their conformation, their shape, um, how are they conjugated, and zeta-potential, which again is related to charge, which has to do with stability. You'll notice that um, next to each of these set of questions, we have these acronyms. And these are the acronyms that I'll be speaking about in the bulk of this webinar. Uh, these are the techniques that are used in the characterization. So we'll get to these a little bit later. And finally, once we have a product uh, and it is uh, destined for perhaps for commercial or clinical applications, we need to verify that it is well behaved. And so again, how does it behave in terms of aggregation, stability? Um, is the drug which needs to be bound or encapsulated in the nanoparticle in fact uh, uh, in that particle or is it free and in solution? Has it come off? And what are the reaction kinetics, for instance, uh, when we uh, change from the formulation to the physiological environment and we expect uh, the drug to come free or perhaps some degradation, um, how does that happen? So again, we have these light scattering based techniques, which I'll be describing. So what do batch measurements mean? Uh, this is the essence of part one of the series. Batch means unfractionated, so that means we're going to measure the solutions as is without any separation based on uh, size of the particles or some other property. 
Uh, the reason that we use batch measurements is because that allow they, they allow us to characterize average values, uh, for instance, average milk hair weight, average size. Uh, we are able, in fact, to obtain coarse size distributions ranging from uh, sub-nanometer up to microns um, using dynamic light scattering so we can get a rough size distribution without perturbing the system. And then batch measurements also permit the measurement of uh, temperature and concentration dependence to elucidate those properties. Uh, they're also useful for looking at um, relatively rapid reaction kinetics. By rapid, I don't mean sub-second or millisecond, but I essentially mean something which is uh, faster than the time scale of several hours, because if the kinetics are longer than several hours, uh, probably what we'll be doing will be sampling aliquots and running them on a separation uh, based measurement, a fractionated measurement. Batch measurement means we mix things together and we observe their behavior uh, uh, over the course of, of seconds, minutes, and hours uh, to, to characterize their reaction kinetics. The primary techniques based on light scattering that apply to batch mode are dynamic light scattering, which uh, as we'll see measures uh, size and some other properties, electrophoretic light scattering, which measures charge instead of potential, and composition gradient light scattering, which is a technique which uh, varies the composition, uh, concentration, and other properties to observe how, uh, uh, how the uh, uh, colligative properties or other types of uh, mixtures uh, impact the, the nanoparticles, in particular in terms of kinetics. The second part of this series, which will be a separate webinar, uh, pertains to online measurements. And so those are fractionated measurements that are useful for obtaining more accurate distributions of size and mass than you can obtain with an unfractionated measurement. There are also other advantages. You can get cleaner data. Um, it's, it's better for looking at slower reaction kinetics. And those techniques, uh, which we'll describe in the second webinar, pertain to combination of light scattering with, with fractionation techniques, such as uh, chromatography or field flow fractionation. So briefly, what are the flavors of light scattering that we'll be applying in order to obtain the biophysical characterization of the molecules and the particles? The first one is called multi-angle light scattering, which actually is a form of static light scattering. So static light scattering uh, measures the time averaged intensity of the uh, scattering. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take a laser beam run it through our solution, which contains particles, and measure in the detectors the intensity of the scattered light. And we're going to do this not just at one angle, but often as, as a function of angle. So you might have a detector here, and a de detector here, and perhaps a detector here. Uh, and that uh, angle-dependent measurement gives us a lot of important information. Um, if you look at the first principles physics of this process, you'll find that there's a very robust relationship between the scattered intensity and the essential properties that we'd like to measure. So uh, it turns out that the scattered intensity is proportional to the product of molecular weight, the weight concentration, and then this angular um, uh, dependence that comes in as P of theta. That means that if we measure the scattered intensity and we measure the concentration, we can determine from first principles the uh, weight average molecular weight of the solution, of the molecules in solution. If the molecules or the particles have a size which is larger than a, a radius of approximately 10 to 12 nanometers or diameter of about 20 to 25 nanometers, um, that will induce an angular dependence to the light scattering. And so by having multiple detectors and mapping out that angular dependence, we can determine the size of the molecules in terms of the root mean square radius, which is also known as radius of a gyration, or RG. So multi-angle light scattering, which we uh, call by its acronym MALS, gives us from, from first principles the molar mass of the molecules or particles in solution, a measure of size, the RMS radius. And because it is first principles, we can also determine <coughs> with deep char deeper characterization, interaction parameters, such as the stoichiometry of complexes that form, their dissociation constants, their rates of association dissociation, and uh, another, thermodi <coughs> another thermodynamic parameter, 
known as the osmotic second bureau coefficient, um, known as A2 or sometimes B22, which pertains to nonspecific interactions. MALS is great because it does give us a first principles and rather in-depth characterization um, through this basic uh, physical relationship. The second flavor of light scattering is called dynamic light scattering, also known as Quell's quasi-elastic quasi light scattering. And in DLS, instead of measuring the, the time average intensity, we're actually going to look at the fluctuations uh, that actually appear as noise uh, in, the, uh, in the plot of light versus time. Now, this is a very short time scale. We're talking about milliseconds and microseconds, so very rapid fluctuations. And this noise actually contains useful information. Uh, the fluctuations arise from the Brownian motion of the particles in solution. And so as we illuminate these two particles, uh, which are jittering around in solution under Brownian motion, the light that is scattered from these particles will arrive at the detector. And depending on the distance between the particles, their size, the distance from the detector, these light waves may arrive in phase or out of phase or somewhere in between. And thus will undergo constructive or, or destructive uh, interference, giving us uh, these fluctuations. So these fluctuations arise from the interference effects of the coherent light and the Brownian motion of the particles in solution. By analyzing the rate of fluctuation, we can determine uh, the diffusion uh, coefficient of the particles, d. And then using the Stokes-Einstein relationship, uh, using the, uh, the temperature and the viscosity of the solution, we can then obtain a, me obtain a measure of size known as Rh, the hydrodynamic radius. So previously with MALS, we obtained a measure of size called the root mean square radius. With DLS, we obtain the hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic radius. It's a, a different measure of size, and we'll talk later about the difference between those two measurements. So from first principles, DLS gives us the diffusion coefficient, which can be converted to a measure of size called the hydrodynamic radius. There are various analyses that may be performed on the, uh, on the time series of the light intensity fluctuations. One is called cumulant analysis. That will give us an average radius of the particles in solution and a measure of the polydispersity. So what is the range of sizes around that average? And a more sophisticated analysis is known as regularization. That actually gives you a, a rough size distribution without any previous fractionation. Uh, and the ELS will give you typically sizes ranging from less than a nanometer up to several microns without any types of fractionation. It's not a very uh, accurate or a very high resolution analysis, but it, but it does do the job um, uh, quickly with very little sample and is so quite valuable. The third flavor of light scattering is electrophoretic light scattering or phase analysis light scattering. And what that does is uh, to look at the phase of the scattered light when the particles are subjected to an electric field. And so that electric field will cause a charged uh, ion or particle to, uh, to, uh, to uh, move in the direction or opposite direction of the field, depending on its, on its net charge. The uh, analysis of the phase of the light as it changes due to that motion gives us a, a measure of the speed of the particle, so that's V. And if we divide the drift speed by the uh, electrophoretic field, we get a value called the electrophoretic mobility mu. And this uh, helps us uh, understand how charged these particles are. That charge, of course, uh, does impact the stability. So if the particles are highly charged, uh, they will repel each other, and they will remain stable in solution. If they're weakly charged, then often there will be other forces that uh, that charge is insufficient to overcome will lead to aggregation or flocculation. Uh, y technology offers a, a unique twist on standard phase analysis light scattering called MPPALS, which utilizes uh, many detectors in parallel, gives us a huge boost in terms of sensitivity and also the speed of measurement. Also allows us to 
reduce the applied voltage, which is really important when we're measuring biological samples, which may be relatively fragile. Uh, it also works in high salt buffer, uh, will work with fluorescing samples, and has a, several other unique capabilities that I'll get to later on. Okay. So those are the three flavors of light scattering. Once we have light scattering, uh, type of light scattering, we then create a tool, a light scattering tool, which is a combination of a sample preparation delivery technique with a particular flavor of light scattering. Uh, in batch measurements, basically there's not a heck of a lot going on in terms of sample preparation. And so the, basically we will deliver the sample in a, uh, in a cavette or in a, a well plate or through an injection to the flow cell of the light measurement, of the uh, light scattering detector. So the first tool is based on dynamic light scattering. There are two instruments that Wyatt offers. The first one is a standard uh, dynamic light scattering instrument that uses cuvettes. So like many others, it uses cuvettes. Uh, but it does have a few unique capabilities. Can use very low sample volumes. So using a quartz cuvette, we can use as little as one and a quarter microliters of sample. Uh, if your sample is very precious, that's very important. A very large temperature range for scanning temperature. Uh, in addition to the dynamic light scattering single photon counting module, it incorporates an, a, a dedicated static light scattering detector, which is used for measurement, uh, more sensitive measurement of molecular weight and second viral coefficient. And it's also possible to incorporate an optical filter if your particles fluoresce under laser illumination. That means that you can make measurements of dynamic light scattering and, uh, and electrophoretic light scattering, uh, even if your particles fluoresce, which is uh, relatively unusual in these types of instruments. The second light scattering instrument is quite unique. Uh, it is the dynamic light scattering plate reader. And so this uses, utilizes stand, industry standard micro well plates, 96, 384, 1536. And you just pop them into the instrument. There's no fluidics involved. Uh, there's no perturbation to the uh, solutions during the course of measurement because the measurements are made in situ in the micro well plates. And this allows you to set up a plate with many different samples, press go, and let the instrument measure uh, all the wells that are populated, come back later on and look at the results. And this allows you to uh, look at many different formulations, many different concentrations. You can also run temperature scans. And another unique capability of the DynaPro plate reader is the camera, which is built into it, and allows you to take a photograph of each well uh, in order to determine if there are some contaminants or bubbles or precipitates or crystals or other things that might happen in the course of uh, making these measurements. If you're making a, a, a typical DLS measurement with a cuvette, you may be used to taking the cuvette out, holding it up to the light, looking at it, squinting at it, maybe through a, a magnifying glass or a loop to determine if there's a bubble in there. Uh, that doesn't work very well when you have hundreds of samples in a, in a micro well plate. Uh, this camera is really useful in allowing you to uh, uh, check diagnostics in, in terms of what's going on in your wells. Both of these instruments measure essentially the same properties, which are the size distributions obtained by dynamic light scattering, and in particular to look at aggregates as well as sizes. Um, you can look at things like the unfolding or, or aggregation onset temperature, measure the critical micelle temperature or the critical micelle concentration. And if you have slow kinetics, which are on the order of minutes to hours, you can uh, look at the kinetics of a self-assembly or dissociation just by populating those, uh, those wells or the cuvettes, popping them instrument into the instrument and letting it go. Quick review of what we can measure with dynamic light scattering. DLS measures the uh, interference effects due to Brownian motion. We see these light intensity fluctuations, measure the diffusion coefficient, and extract from that hydrodynamic radii. Um, the cumulance analysis, is applied to what we call monomodal samples, uh, samples where we have one uh, central population size uh, with a little bit of distribution around it. We measure the average radius and polydispersity, or the regularization analysis when you have multimodal distributions, meaning that there are several populations uh, far apart from each other in terms of size. And uh, the beautiful thing about dynamic light scattering is through the dynamic light scattering plate reader, uh, it is amenable to high-throughput screening. 
you can make these measurements uh, in as little as a few seconds for each well and run over hundreds or thousands of wells in the course of a day, run temperature scans over many, many wells. It's quite, uh, quite useful. Briefly to explain monomodal size distributions. So if we have a, some part, a completely monodispersed population of particles, we will see in the size distribution a sharp peak uh, located at particular value. And we can measure the average value of that peak to within about 1%. Now, if there's a little bit of aggregation or a, a distribution of sizes which are not too different than our, our essential particle, or our, our original particle, uh, then we'll see a broadening of that peak. It might have uh, a slightly shifted uh, average value of the radius, but we can see that because we have a few percent change uh, sensitivity. And we'll see a change in the width as well, which is measured in the polydispersity. So in this way, dynamic light scattering can give us an indication of, of um, oligomerization or formation of small aggregates. Multimodal size distributions are those where we have some very disparate sizes in solution. So if you, the, these two particles differ in radius by, by at least three to five times in size, we can see these two different populations in the size distribution. Here we have narrow peaks because each one of these has a, a narrow distribution of sizes. But again, if there is a little bit of aggregation uh, of each one or some disparity in sizes, that will lead to the broadening. So each of these size ranges would, will have its central value, its average RH, as well as polydispersity. So this is uh, 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 an indication of what you can pick up with dynamic light scattering, uh, size distributions without fractionation. So let's look at an application of that to some core shell microgel particles. And these are data that were um, presented, acquired and presented and published by a group of uh, Andrew Lyon, looking at some uh, thermally induced conformation changes on thermoresponsive microgels. So what we have here is measurements of the average value of uh, the radius, RH, as a function of temperature ranging from 20 degrees up to 45 over here. And if we look just at the black squares, which are the uh, just the core alone without the shell, we can see that the core is highly thermoresponsive. Its radius changes from about 110 at 20 degrees, going through a transition with a central point about 32, uh, and then goes down to about 45 or 47 uh, nanometers. So the core part, the core part of this core shell microgel is quite thermoresponsive. When we add on two types of shells, uh, DMHA2 and DMHA4, we can see that the, these shells do not have the same thermoresponse and they're kind of holding the particle, they're trying to keep it from collapsing uh, as it goes through, as the core goes through its, uh, its uh, thermoresponsive change. And so we can see that the, uh, the change is not as great, is not as steep, and then does flatten out actually much later on. Actually, the DMHA2 only flattens out when it reaches a much higher temperature at about 45, <clears throat> whereas the shell flattens out at about 30, 33 or so. And so this is a, a quick and easy way. You pop your solutions into a cuvette, put the cuvette into the, uh, into the detector, tell it to ramp the temperature. This probably took on the order of uh, 10 to 15 minutes to run each one of these. And so it's a quick and easy way to measure these. One of the nice things about this measurement is that it's a very direct measurement. So another way to make these measurements, for instance, might be to use fluorescence or some other techniques, which are indirect measurements of the collapse of the shell. Here you're directly measuring a, a, an essential physical property, which is the size. And so you can see very directly what's happening uh, to the particles as they go through this transition. Uh, dynamic light scattering gives you a measure of size through a hydrodynamic radius, but there's additional information in the same light scattering signal uh, because even though you do have fluctuations, you can still measure the average value uh, 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 that the uh, intensity fluctuates around. And that average value is essentially the static light scattering, and it's a measure of the molecular weight. And so by comparing the, uh, the average value 
which gives you molecular weight. Uh, here that's represented as count rate. It's the count rate of the photon counting detector. You can see that uh, this particular molecule, which is a protein, uh, through the temperature ramp essentially did not change very much in terms of molecular weight. And so there's no aggregation or dissociation in the course of the temperature ramp. On the other hand, something did happen, happen to the rate of fluctuation. The diffusion coefficient changed, and therefore the size changed. And so we can see this transition over here. And what, what it tells us is that as it went through this temperature transition, uh, this protein unfolded. It got bigger. Uh, it slowed down in terms of its diffusion rate, and therefore we see the increase in RH, but with no associated increase in molecular weight, and therefore there was no aggregation, just an unfolding effect. And so there is much of it, there, there, there's actually quite a lot of information that you can extract from the dynamic light scattering signal. Uh, as I mentioned, you can do this in high throughput, and so it's really nice to set up a, a screen of formulation buffers to run an automated screen of uh, conditions for um, minimum or optimal stability. And these data were, distributed, were contributed by uh, folks at the Sabine uh, Vaccine Institute and the Texas Children's Hospital Center at Baylor College. And we have set up the software, dynamic software, to color code the results of the DLS scan over the solutions in this plate. And so the color coding is set up so that red pertains to a very narrow distribution okay, at a low size. And that means that under these conditions, the, uh, the protein in this case was quite stable and monodisperse. Blue corresponds to uh, some distribution of sizes. So you can see that there is a much larger aggregate coming in. Um, I'll note that even though it looks like that there's quite a lot of these aggregates, um, because of the relationship between the intensity of the scattered light and the molecular weight, aggregates scatter a lot, of, a lot more light relative to their concentration than do monomers. And so even though that the intensity of the scattered light is quite high, the actual concentration of these aggregates is not high compared to the monomers. And so we have some a monomer with a, a bit of a wider distribution that tells us that there are some lower oligomers as well as a population of these large aggregates. Finally, the black wells are those which have been color coded to represent extremely aggregated samples. Um, it's hard to see, but this is actually about a micron in size. So we've gone from monomeric proteins all the way up to a micron. So it's very easy to set up this scan, run all the different formulation conditions you'd like, come back after, this took about an hour to run, a little less than an hour to run, and uh, see on the screen the color coded results uh, to understand which of these formula con formulation conditions really work well and which you should completely avoid in further work. Another way to utilize the um, uh, dynamic light scattering capabilities in the micro well plates is to identify optimal processing conditions for nanoparticle uh, formation. Uh, and this, uh, this publication, contributed by Dennis Lung, uh, in APS Farm SciTech, uh, described how described a process of optimizing uh, milling conditions for creation of drug nanoparticles. So their their drug was a small molecule which was in solid form, and they were milling it using this acoustic process, which involves putting in some uh, some small particles, uh, applying acoustic energy, causing those solids to break up. And in solution, there are also some polymers which coat the particles and prevent their aggregation. And so they, this is actually done in a 96 well plate under many different uh, energy conditions, formulation conditions, different amounts of polymer, different buffers to optimize the creation of these nanoparticles and their isolation with the, by adhering uh, the polymer to prevent the flocculation. Periodically, they would pipette some of the material out of a 96 well plate into a 384 well plate, which was then put into the Dynapro plate reader to assess formulation conditions. And they were able then to quite automatically determine the particle size as a function of the surfactant, which was used to um, uh, prevent the aggregation. Uh, the dissolution time, so how, for how long were they applying this process? And in this data, there's also the, uh, the different types of a uh, 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 buffers that were uh, uh, tested. 
And so by setting up this, this completely automated system with the different uh, acoustic resonant conditions and formulation conditions on the one hand, the automated measurements on the other hand, they could complete in the course of a few hours what otherwise might take weeks to actually do by, by standard techniques. And so the, really the gain in productivity that you get with high throughput DLS can be measured uh, in terms of uh, reducing to less than a day, again, what might take you many people, many technicians, uh, many weeks to accomplish using standard dynamic light scattering wind cuvettes. Here's an example of utilizing dynamic light scattering to uh, track the phase diagram of a of micelle formation. And so it started out as a unimer um, at, uh, at low temperatures with a size which is on the order of eight or nine nanometers in radius. And you can see this very sharp transition right around 41C. Uh, right at 41C or 42, that you can see an equilibrium between monomers and micelles. So both of them are present and both of them are detected. Uh, and then at a little higher temperature, all the monitors, all of the monomers be, are, are incorporated into my cells. And then finally, once you get to about 50 C, we see this massive change in size up to greater than uh, 1500 nanometers associated with aggregation. Again, you typically might do this with fluorescence, um, but dynamic light scattering, it gives you a direct measurement and you don't have to guess in terms of what the fluorescence actually means. It tells you what's going on. Dynamic light scanning tells you that there's a size change. These are the sizes. And then finally, there's this uh, transition to a much larger aggregate. This is a stable region for the micelle, and this is an actual size. And so you get really useful and direct uh, indication of what your system is, is, uh, is doing. By automating this in the dynamic light scattering plate reader, under a series of conditions and concentrations, you could uh, immediately determine the CMC, the critical micelle concentration, the critical micelle temperature, and you can use two different measurements uh, at the same time. You can see the change in size associated with RH, and you can see the change in molecular weight associated with count rate. And by comparing those, you can get a very nice indication Again, a, a deeper indication of what is actually happening to your system as it goes through these transitions. Uh, if you do need to do very rapid temperature ramps and a very high size, uh, higher temperature range up to 150 C, the Nanostar will allow you to make those same measurements. Uh, it, it ramps pretty quickly and it has a larger temperature range than the plate reader. Of course, it's limited to a single measurement, at, a single sample at a time, but sometimes this is the right system to use if you need those additional capabilities. So to summarize the use of the dynamic light scattering tool, our light scattering tool number one, it helps us characterize size and solution behavior. It will give us both the size and rough, but size distributions over a large range from sub-nanometer up to microns. It will help us determine the thermal behavior, including unfolding, aggregation, uh, dissociation, CMC and CMT. It will help us automatically screen optimal buffer conditions for stable formulations, um, for optimizing our processing conditions or reaction conditions. And it will quickly assess these solution properties with just a few microliters of sample. If you're using micro well plates, uh, it depends on which plate you're using, of course. A 384 well plate, which is uh, one of the workhorses of the industry, uses about 10 to 20 microliters typically. The, the 96 wool plate uses about 50 to 100 microliters. And if you can use the 1536 wool plate as well, uh, which just uses a, a few microliters. Uh, in the Nanostar with the cuvettes, we have a quartz cuvette, which can be used with as little as one and a quarter microliters of, of solution. And we have disposable cuvettes, which actually have very high optical quality, which use as little as four microliters of solution. So you can be very parsimonious with sample if necessary, but if you prefer the convenience, you can load them up with a lot more sample. Light scattering tool number two, which is MP-PALS. And so again, this is a measurement of electrophoretic mobility. The system that we use to, to, to measure MP-PALS includes the Mobius, which is the electrophoretic mobility detector. It does incorporate a dynamic light scattering detector as well as a PALS detector. And it can, can be, it can be combined with some additional instruments, um, including a standard HPLC. 
which can be used to automate sample injection, <clears throat> and the Atlas here, which I'll mention in a second. So one of the unique capabilities of the Mobius in terms of uh, uh, PALS detectors is that it, it is compa compatible with an HPLC auto sampler. Um, it can be automated through the uh, dynamic software that comes with the instrument to uh, load and inject and then flush out samples via an auto sampler, make the measurements each time. It can also be loaded manually. Uh, it does offer a dip cell. It offers injection type of uh, a loading. And so quite versatile in terms of the ways that can be used. It can also be combined, since it does have a flow cell, with online separation. And that's something I'll mention uh, later on. It has a very high range of applied voltages. So if you have fragile biological samples, you can apply quite low voltages. And if you have uh, robust particles in low conductivity uh, solutions, you can apply quite high voltages. If you are working in physiological or high salt buffers, uh, you'll know that uh, there's a problem with electrophoresis, uh, which can uh, cause bubbles. Uh, that impact the flow of charge of current uh, in the system and give you noisy measurements. Uh, and we can overcome that with a very uh, unique system to, uh, to this field, which is the Atlas pressurization system. What it does is, uh, is once we have sample in the flow cell, it applies pressure and squashes essentially those bubbles. It pre prevents the formation of bubbles and allows us to make robust measurements, even with proteins and other small nanoparticles uh, in physiological or high salt buffers. We can incorporate the optical filter for fluorescent particles, still make very good measurements of size and mobility, even if particles for us. It's a closed system, so if you have volatile solvents, you can work with those as well. And it can work in batch or flow mode. Properties measured by, uh, by this system include the electrophoretic mobility, size and size distributions via the incorporated embedded dynamic light scattering module. And the combination of mobility and DLS allows you to calculate the charge on the particle or its set of potential. The primary applications are assessments of colloidal stability. So the charge impacts the colloidal stability. Um, but it's also in particular for uh, applications in, in, in nanoparticle drug delivery is assessing the NP ratio, that is the ratio, for instance, of DNA to polymer, which will allow you to uh, calculate the net charge, uh, which is really critical for transmembrane delivery if you're thinking about um, uh, perhaps gene vectors or other uh, applications of these nanoparticles for delivering their payload through a cell membrane, cellular membrane. Briefly, the, uh, the technology. Um, and so what we have is a flow cell over here. We have two electrodes, and we apply an alternating voltage. Um, the laser beam comes in, scatters off of the particles. Okay. Um, that laser beam has a portion split off called the reference beam, which goes around the flow cell. And then these two beams meet on the detector array. Uh, and the, uh, the velocity of the particles under the applied field impacts the frequency of the scattered light. Uh, and so by interfering them, we actually see these um, oscillations on the detector array, slow oscillations that are measurable uh, using standard electronics. And those oscillations allow us to calculate the drift velocity under the electric field. The ratio gives us the electrophoretic mobility. And by combining the electrophoretic mobility with the hydrodynamic radius measured by DLS, we can calculate zeta potential. Uh, the unique thing about MPPALS, the system in the Mobius, the technology behind the Mobius, is that it incorporates 31 independent simultaneous measurements. Uh, and instead of using the typical uh, photon counting module for PALS measurements, it uses a photodiode array. That that, incorporate, that gives us the 31 detectors that give us higher sensitivity, uh, reduced measurement time, so we can measure, we can get very good measurements with less than 30 seconds per sample. And it, this uh, photodetector array is impervious to saturation, which means that fluorescence will not be a problem for this system. So here's just an example of a measurement of some dedrimers in very high ionic strength solution, 500 millimolars of sodium nitrate. 
uh, and we can see uh, the measurements of the effective charge of these dendrimers through the dendrimer generation from, well, from three, four, five, all the way up to seven. And there's a function of the chemistry of the system, uh, so different amounts of uh, uh, acidic acid incorporated into the dendrimer, which gives it a different charge, of course. Uh, and these are very robust and accurate measurements. You can see the, that there's uh, very little noise in these measurements. They're very robust. Uh, and despite the very high salt concentrations, we can measure proteins and small nanoparticles with, in solutions with conductivity of up to 100 millisiemens per centimeter, uh, which is very high sensitivity. Uh, of course, you can measure much larger particles uh, easily when, when, even if the salt uh, concentration is high, when you have very large particles, that's not so much of a problem. They scatter a lot of light, you have robust signals. The problem is when you have proteins, and we can make measurements on uh, proteins of just a few mix per mil with these very high conductivities, which is quite unique. So what is what are the applications of MPPALS? Why would we want to use the combined MPPALS DLS system? Well, first of all, it does everything DLS does because it has an incorporated DLS detector. In addition, it allows you to screen formulations to optimize the zeta potential and optimize the stability of the formulation. Um, if there are changes in the surface charge that are reflected in the zeta potential or net charge, they could be indications of chemical modifications to your system. And so this could be a, a very quick and easy way of testing for chemical modifications on the surface of the nanoparticles. Uh, and finally, there's another unique uh, property of the Mobius uh, compared to most other uh, DLS, or PALS instruments in that it measures the DLS simultaneously with the MB PALS, which means that we're measuring the zeta potential simultaneously with size. So if something happens to our particles as a result of applying the electric field, we will immediately see that in the size measurements, uh, which are taking place simultaneously. So any type of degradation that occurs during the measurement is immediately picked up. The third technique that I'll be speaking about today uh, is CG MALS, which is composition gradient multi-angle light scattering. Okay. Now this is a stop flow system that utilizes multi-angle light scattering detector. Uh, that's our DAWN over here. Uh, measures static light scattering and therefore measures molecular weight and size. Um, and it uses a stop flow system, which is the Calypso accessory, which does sample preparation and delivery. Now, typically, the CG MOL system is used as a label-free, mobilization-free technique for characterizing uh, biomolecular interactions. Uh, it's utilized for a wide range of stoichiometry, self and heteroassociation, a uh, large range of KDs. Uh, looking at equilibrium and kinetics and specific or nonspecific interactions. In the context of drug delivery nanoparticles, I think the most important application is actually looking at kinetics of, uh, of the properties of the nanoparticles. And so whereas the primary uh, properties that will be uh, measured with biomolecular interactions would be affinity and stoichiometry and osmotic viral coefficients, reaction rates are what we'll be looking for in the context of the nanoparticle uh, systems. The heart of the CG MOL system is the Dawn multi-angle light scattering detector. So it could be a Dawn Helios II, which measures uh, molecular weights and is appropriate for um, macromolecules and particles with radii up to 500 nanometers. Alternatively, you might be using the Mini Dawn Trios which is suitable for the macromolecules and nanoparticles with radius up to 50 nanometers. Optionally, you might choose to include in your system, depending on what you're measuring, uh, a concentration detector. And so again, depending on the analyte and the conditions, uh, you might use an Optolab, which is a refractive index detector, or a standard UV detector. And another optional, uh, 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 or sorry, another option for this is embedding the dynamic light scattering module into the MALS detector. So the, uh, the Helios and the Trios allow you to take a dynamic light scattering module, put it inside the detector, utilize the same flow cell as the MALS measurements, 
and therefore your DLS and moles are measured in the same volume on the same molecules or particles at the same time. Conceptually, the Calypso is a, a, a computer-controlled syringe pump system, and what it does is it draws and mixes <clears throat> up to three different solutions. Because light scattering is particularly sensitive to dust and other types of particulates, it's really important to uh, filter these solutions independently, and so the Calypso incorporates uh, filters with, with a range of pore sizes, uh, mixers, and then by flowing these syringes at different flow rates, we can create different compositions. The solution is mixed, injected into the detectors, the flow stops. This takes uh, a, a few seconds to occur, and then we can look at, uh, over time, over the course of seconds, minutes, and hours, the change in signals and interpret those in terms of change in molecular weight and size of our solutions. <clears throat> And so this is a very nice example of doing uh, just this. Again, this is uh, contributed by groups, by, by Mike Smith, who was with uh, Andrew Lyon at Georgia Tech, and looking at some responsive microgels. And what they did was uh, take these, these microgels and mix them with peri periodate, which causes their erosion. It, uh, it basically degrades the crosslinks within the polymer. And you can see conceptually what's happening. We're starting with a dense polymer at early time, and then uh, the, uh, the outer, uh, outer polymers are degraded, the links are broken, and it becomes a little diffuse. And then finally, the periodate diffuses inside, and the links break up forever, uh, break up throughout. So what do we see? Well, we see two measurements. We have molecular weight, which is this, and we can see that Here's the injection, the flow stops here, and there's a rapid decline in molecular weight. And then over time, over the course of half an hour and 40 minutes, we see this additional decline in molecular weight. And the, this occurs over two orders of magnitude in molecular weight. So we're about uh, 250 uh, gigadaltons here, down to about 220 um, megadaltons over here on this size. Okay, so makes sense that if we uh, break up the crosslinks, we have a, a reduction in molecular weight. What else do we see? Well, we have also have a measurement of the size of the particle, the root mean square radius determined by multi-angle light scattering. And interestingly enough, at the beginning, actually the root mean square radius increases, and then there's a, a relatively small change uh, over the course of time. And so that's that's a little bit curious. Uh, and And the interpretation is as illustrated here. Uh, it shows us that even though we're breaking the crosslinks and reducing the overall molecular weight of the polymers, they're not breaking up. They're kind of sticking together. And the overall uh, core structure of the particle is retained even though the internal structure is being degraded. So we have approximately two order of mag magnitude decrease in molecular weight but very little change in the root mean square radius. So there's a thinning of the structure as the crosslinks are cut, but the growth structure is retained overall. Uh, here's another example of studying uh, using the Clipso MOL system, the CG MOLs, to study the encapsulation process of a, nano, of a protein into a nanogel. Here the nanogel was a model drug delivery system. The protein in this case was cytochrome C was a model uh, protein, and what uh, what uh, Smith and Lyon did here was incorporate those nanogels into protein solutions of different concentrations, and look at the change in molecular weight and size of the nanogels as a function of protein concentration. So if you look at the molecular weight, we can see that as the uh, protein concentration increases, we have this increase in molecular weight. So even though the um, <clears throat> the nanogel itself is very small or it's very sparse and doesn't have a high molecular weight. It's on the order of 10 to the ninth uh, grams per mole. As it starts, it's a very open matrix. As it starts loading up protein, its molecular weight increases dramatically. That tells us that it's binding a lot of protein. Curiously, as we look at the change in RMS radius, it actually declines a little bit. So from 225 down to less than 200 nanometers. 
So how is it that the molecular weight is increasing dramatically, and yet the RMS radius is decreasing? Well, if we look at a model of, uh, or, a, or a cartoon of what's actually happening inside the microgel, we see that the microgel is this very sparse matrix. Uh, it is loaded up with uh, negative charge, and that charge actually helps uh, hold the, the, the particle apart. So the, the repulsion gives it its size. It, even though the molecular weight is not very high, it gives a very large size of 225 nanometers. The cytochrome C has a positive charge, which causes it to diffuse into the microgel and load into the interstitial spaces. But now that it, we're incorporating this positive charge, uh, it's neutralizing the overall charge of the particle, which allows it now to collapse because there's less uh, internal repulsion. The particle is collapsing. And so this incorporation of the protein is what gives us this massive increase in molecular weight and yet a decrease in molecular size. Fascinating example. So these are just a couple of examples of the things that you can do with CG models, uh, looking at changes in molecular in size as a function of composition or time. Uh, it provides a reliable assessment of biomolecular self-association, including affinity and oligomeric states. It's also used to analyze heterosociations. In the context of nanodrug delivery systems, we'll use CG models to analyze the kinetics of reactions and also drug loading through the changes in these very direct measurements of molecular weight and size uh, on time scales of seconds to hours. And the nice thing about the Clipso is that we'll automate for you a series of preparative conditions. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to measure CMC, uh, that's also uh, an option in this system. If you're interested in learning more about how the CG models characterizes biomolecular interactions, I invite you to read my article. So let's revisit our initial questions. We asked about characterizing the solution properties of the constituent macromolecules, and we saw how, we actually didn't see secmols yet, how DLS and MPPALs are utilized to characterize molecular weight, oligomeric state, size, uh, and size, and charge. Okay. Um, we utilize DLS and MPPALs to characterize the solution properties of the particles, of the nanoparticles themselves. And then finally, their stability through DLS I remember that we can automate a whole series of formulation conditions with the DLS plate reader, allowing us to test uh, many different conditions in a very short time for aggregation stability. And with CG models, we can also look at the reaction kinetics. If you're interested in learning more about how uh, these instruments and these techniques are utilized uh, in the characterization of drug nanoparticles, I invite you to visit our website uh, www.com slash bibliography. It does allow you to search a database which incorporates over 11,000 peer-reviewed publications, including quite a few in Nature, Science, PNAS, uh, et cetera, and uh, JAX too. And you can see how some of your peers have been util utilizing light scattering in their studies of these systems. Part two of this webinar series will deal with online uh, light scattering, uh, online implying a fractionation system upstream of the light scattering instrument. Usually that fractionation will be uh, based on size, by hydrodynamic radius, and that will allow us to address some of the other questions that were presented in the, in the previous slide. Uh, through size quotient chromatog chromatography or field flow fractionation coupled to the light scattering instruments. If you're interested in more info, first of all, I invite you to email me. So here's my email address, dsummitwide.com. And you can also uh, visit our website. Um, some useful links include .com slash solutions, which uh, incorporates a wealth of information about how the various properties are measured by light scattering, the light scattering tools and techniques, and the application range. Um, you can learn more about the theory and literature, application notes uh, in the library, and you can uh, also view our on-demand webinar library uh, about DLS models, FFPALs, all these techniques and how they're used in different uh, situations, including polymer characterization, protein characterization, biotherapeutics, vaccines, and more in wyatt.com slash webinars. And so with that, um, uh, I have completed the slides for webinar part one, 
and we'll turn it back to Lindsay. All right. Thank you very much, Dan, for your presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions regarding this webinar, again, please email Dan at dsome at wyatt.com. And we'll post a running Q&A summary of the webinar's web page with the questions and answers that we receive. Wyatt's on-demand webinar library is a great resource where you can find recordings covering many additional aspects of light scattering technology and applications. So please look um, for the second webinar in the series, as Dan mentioned, Drug Delivery Nanoparticles Illuminated, the Light Scattering Toolkit Part 2 Online Measurements, which focuses on fractionated measurements using SEC malls and FFF malls. So thanks again for joining us, and this now concludes our webinar for today. <laughs>